Friends, we have before us what might be called harsh sayings of Jesus. You may have heard them before. I'm asking you today to hear them in a new way because these are powerful, concise metaphors with very specific teaching in them. Don't let the metaphors blind you to the immediacy of their teaching, to what you need to know from eternity on how to live your life, how to come closer to spirit, how to know God, the big questions of life. In some Bibles, this is headed with a subtitle that says, How to Become a Christian. You know, many of us grow up brought to church by our parents. We remember Sunday school and camp and picnics. And we might go through a lifetime of being part of a Christian community and never realize that our Lord gave us instructions to follow, to implement difficult ones. The easy ones are to go do something, even if you have to go do it in Africa. The hard ones are to live it out in here, to get past the stuff that goes on in here to make room for God. So hear these words straight from the teacher on his way to Jerusalem, to the cross. The truth is out now. His disciples know that this is unlike anything anybody expected. And there's something about the Spirit that is always that way. It's never what we expect. If you've come to think you know it, and you've got it all figured out, then you're missing something. Always new. So we begin with hearing that they go through a Samaritan village. Metaphor. Jesus is wrongly rejected. We're not interested, thank you very much. And I suggest to you that this is about our world today. Our culture says no thank you. And when it uses Jesus' name, it's in vain, as you know. We have committed the sacrilege of rejecting that which is holy and sacred. Not somebody's religion, not that old time religion, Eternal truth, cosmic reality, not interested. We're going to buy into materialism, secular materialism, three-dimensional world. If you can't see it, it's not real. Somebody called that the superstition of materialism. It's tragic. People in my line of work who stand over dying people, believe you me, that's tragic. When somebody's got nothing to go beyond the despair and the fear and the dead end, no sense of spirit, that's a terrible loss. May you not end up there. And I'm telling you, you can go through church for a lifetime and still end up there. If you don't listen to these teachings, to what Jesus is saying to you, in no uncertain terms, harsh sayings. So this is for each one of us. For our good, not in condemnation, not in judgment, out of love. In fact, that story of the Samaritan village, when the disciples want that rain of fire down upon the sacrilege of rejecting the holy, just like Elijah did with the prophets of Baal, Jesus says no. Jesus says no. We just move on. Now understand this, Jesus moves on. For those who reject God, God's love, God's outreach, Jesus can only move on. Cannot do a miracle in your life if you shut the door. Don't shut that door. It's a loss that is eternal. And friends, this is universal. This is for all people. When spirit comes into our lives, we have the choice to accept, to reject. And how many of our brothers and sisters in the world are rejecting it? You can feel it, you can see it. This is not a belief system, this is not an intellectual thing, this is not 
we're right, they're wrong. This is life and death. In living in a spiritual, conscious, awakened way. In a world that has forgotten it. And then Jesus goes on with these teachings for those who have not rejected Him. And so we begin with the first example. We have an individual, we have someone like you, someone like me, who has a yearning in their heart for something greater than what life has to offer. Some sense of the sacred, of the mystery at the heart of life. I'll follow you wherever you go. And this is for anyone in any religion, in any culture, who has this this sense of mystery that they must respond to. And out of excitement, we'll do anything. And what does Jesus say? He doesn't say, how wonderful, come follow me. That's a good boy and girl. You've got the picture now. He says this strange saying. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, son of man has no place to lay his head. Now I want you to put that in the context of Middle Eastern desert. The foxes, the birds from that area were the most wandering nomadic creatures around. Jesus picks those two precisely. So that even the ones that wander and never stop have a home. Son of man has no place to lay his head. Now let's be sure you don't misunderstand this. This isn't Jesus feeling sorry for himself. God forbid that you should think of it that way. This is a teaching. And this teaching tells us that you, if you want to be merciful, if you want to forgive or love your enemy, you have no place to lay your head in this world. Let's not be naive. To actually live out these teachings, this way of being, the love of God in the world, you're going to be awfully alone, except maybe in a place like this. But you step out that door, and everything's different. Who here has not tasted the tragedy of trying to do the right thing, the right motivation in their hearts, and being roundly rejected, misunderstood, hated? Don't you know that experience? Haven't you been there? Happens all the time. There is no place in the unregenerate world, in the unconscious world, for that kind of living. So Jesus, at the beginning of our enthusiasm to be spiritual people, sets us straight. Sets us straight. And then we go to the next example. Jesus says, follow me. Now I'm going to call on you to try to find in your memory banks that moment or those few moments in life when you had a special spiritual experience. I sure hope you have. It is possible we are hardwired for it. A moment on a mountainside, on a beach, a quiet moment in the day when something touched you. When that still small voice resonated within and you knew that God was real, that this was not philosophy, that this was authentic reality at the center of your being. And so those of us who've had those experiences, who've heard the call of spirit on our hearts, we're next in this example. Spirit says, follow me. Come this way. Come live this out in the light of God. And the human condition, you and me, what do we do? Uh, Okay, but just wait a minute. Could you wait a minute, please? I've got to go do this over here first. Now, get a picture of this. Holiness is calling you into a whole new way of being, but we've still got some unfinished business, some priorities that are more important than experience of God. Don't we all? And Jesus makes that point by lifting up perhaps the most classic priority, certainly of the Hebrew world, to bury my father. Now, we can understand that priority, can't we? 
The Hebrews not only understood it, it was absolute law. Of course you care for your parents. You do the noble thing in life. And Jesus lifts it up not to denigrate it, but to show us that the greatest priority we have in life is not as important as the priority to connect with God. Why? This is not separating God from family. This is enabling us to truly love family and others. Don't you know? Think of all those Thanksgiving dinners you've had where it wasn't so pretty. Think of all those dysfunctional family deals we all have going. The only way to truly love family is through that love of God, through that openness to God, through letting God's love through us to others. That's why it's a priority it's the way it works. And then the next example. Someone, one of us, has understood that the greatest priority in the world between life and death is encounter with the sacred, encounter with spirit, awakening us to our true identity, to our true purpose. We've understood that, that nothing in life can get in the way of it. But even that person wants to say goodbye to the wonderful things of life. And in fact, that very story exists in the book of Kings, when the great prophet Elijah and his disciple Elisha come together for their great journey into God's call, and Elisha asks his master, please, can I go say goodbye to my family? And Elijah says, yes. And what we have here is a teaching that tells us that in Christ's revelation of how to know God, it is utterly radical. Even that understandable, lovely thing of saying farewell, that last shred of connection with life without God cannot be had. And he tells us these words, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. Take this as a metaphor, message in a bottle teaching. This is not the harshness that you might hear at the surface. This is the reality that if we're going to discover God in this lifetime, other than think about God, no God, no spirit, no truth and live it out we have to go all the way we cannot be part-time Christians religion cannot be a hobby on the side not according to the revelation of the Christ who came here so that you might find your way to God if you're gonna do it if you're gonna enter the experience of the presence of God, it has to be all the way. No looking back. What does it mean to look back? How about feeling guilty? I can never do this. I can never be acceptable to God. I've ruined my chances. Life has beaten me up. I never had a good start. No excuses. God takes us fully once we decide to head that way. We are liberated from our past if we're willing to let go. To be fit for the kingdom means to be able to be conscious of God's presence in life. Now let's see if this can be made real, where the rubber can hit the road kind of thing. What is behind all of this teaching is the surrender of all that we think we want. For God. So that we no longer want what we want, we want what God wants. Now take this a bit further. If you are willing to go that far, then you no longer have requirements of life. You no longer have reason to be upset. It's okay if it's raining on your parade. That makes you a person of peace, doesn't it? 
You don't have anything anymore that's going to make you all upset and uptight because you're just going with God. And you're no longer living like everybody lives. Knee-jerk reaction to everything. Don't you see that's the secret? To dare to give it all to God. To see God in all things. To let go of one's self-will for God's will. That's when you have to put your hand to the plow. To trust God, to stay focused, to not be dependent on anything else that might not work out the way you want it to. Trust in God. Know God is present beyond all the things of this world. And you're going to be okay. You're going to make it through. The word of the Lord for today. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, help us to hear your teaching to apply it to our daily life, to live it out in the moment, to be transformed by it. We ask this in your holy and powerful name. Amen.